You're listening to the Dungeons, Dragons, and Psychology Podcast. Chances are, if you've been role-playing with a group for any length of time, then the title of today's episode probably already reminded you of something that you've had to deal with, which is conflict in your gaming group. And if you, like I, have been gaming with a particular group of individuals for quite some time, what that really means is conflict within your friend circle. I'm Robert Walker, author of Session Zero, the DMG to writing great campaigns in any system, and this is my show where I teach collaborative storytellers how to have more memorable campaigns using psychology. And on today's episode, we are going to be talking about game group conflict. We're going to be discussing how it arises, how to recognize it, and in our tricks of the trade, hopefully how to resolve it. Whenever you have a group of people working towards a common goal or collaborating in an experience together, there's always the potential for drama or conflict. I'm sure you've experienced it, even if you have not experienced it in your gaming group. You've definitely experienced it in your real life. And if you haven't experienced it in your gaming group, I'm slightly jealous of you, but I can also warn you that it's probably inevitable. Conflict is an inevitable part of most groups, and gaming groups are no exception. It can take the form of disagreements about the rules, in-game arguments over strategy or personality clashes. Conflict can cause rifts within your gaming group, so we need to learn how to recognize it when it first starts to pop up. The first step in dealing with it is recognizing that it's taking place and it can manifest in several different ways. Like I already mentioned, arguing is a common sign that there's conflict going on. But you can also see things like individuals withdrawing from conversations or avoiding one another. If you can recognize these signs of conflict before it escalates, you might be able to make changes to better help the group dynamic. It's also important, though, to realize that not all conflict is bad. Healthy debates can be uncomfortable, but they can also push your group to think outside the box and come up with creative solutions. I think an important aspect of identifying your group's conflict would be identifying whether it is an in-game conflict or an out-of-game conflict, a real-life conflict. So in-game conflicts would, of course, be things like slight disagreements over the rules or disagreements about how characters should act in the game, what the next step should be for them to solve a puzzle or how they want to treat a uh, enemy that they have dispatched who may not be dead. Things like that can lead to slight or even serious confrontations within the game that for the most part are often left in character, but can, you know, drift into the out-of-character space and feelings and emotions. The nice thing about in-game conflicts is that, typically speaking, they're a little easier to resolve. A lot of times it can take place with a little DM arbitration and dealing with the situation either as part of the story or just making a decision within the story that the rest of the group can go along with. Often being provided that idea from a third source might solve a simple conflict that happens in game, or simply a reminder that the fact that you're getting upset out of game is based on a story. Sometimes that can set people off, but at other times it's the right thing to do. Just remind the person that they're not actually upset themselves. They're upset on the behalf of their character in the story. And that can remind them not to let it escalate to a real world hurt feelings place. However, if you identify that the conflict is an out of game conflict, it doesn't sim from the story that is being told or the character interactions and that it is actually something that is causing problems within the group dynamic, that is a very different sort of conflict, and it can be a lot more damaging sort of conflict. So not only identifying 
where it is coming from, but identifying the cause of the conflict is going to be important. The Journal of Organizational Behavior identifies five common causes of conflict that can occur specifically in a group setting. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of those, and then later on in Tricks of the Trade, we're going to discuss how you might solve conflict problems or reevaluate the situation based on the cause. So first of all, and probably in my opinion, one of the most common sources of, of conflict problems would be miscommunication. It's common within groups that there are misunderstandings and they can easily arise when individuals are not communicating their thoughts clearly. If somebody has a tendency to shut down and stop communicating, then you will almost certainly have a problem with miscommunication because at least that person's thoughts and feelings are not being shared. Another important factor with miscommunication, especially in today's society, is the idea of using digital information uh, processing or passing of digital information through text messages or emails. Uh, you don't get context in the same way by reading text as you do when you're speaking face to face. So whenever you're having conversations about the group dynamics or goals or whatever it may be via these digital means, there's the potential for miscommunication to take place because things could be taken out of context. A second cause of conflict can come from unmet expectations. So this is when the group would fail to meet the expectations of its members or uh, the expectations of a member might not be aligned with the other members of the group. It can happen if expectations of the group are unclear or, like I said, when that one individual's expectations are not met. So, for example, someone might have an expectation of showing up to game at a certain time every week, and when they are not there, the group expectations are not being met. Or if a person has an expectation of playing their character in a certain way, like they like to play heavy role-playing in a game, and they're in the group that instead is more about combat and doesn't really do character voices or doesn't do any heavy role-play, their expectations of the game individually would not be being met. The third common cause of conflict comes from power struggles. These arise when members of a group attempt to gain control or influence the group in ways that the rest of the group is either not comfortable with or it's manipulative in ways that cause conflict to arise. Power struggles are also a common factor in arguments. People are often trying to gain the position of power in an argument and when it's happening on multiple fronts, especially when there are people behind them who are agreeing with one point or the other, you're definitely in the midst of a power struggle at that point. The fourth common source of conflict would be lack of respect. This can happen when members of the group either are not respecting of the rest of the group or when the whole group is not respectful of one individual. It can also happen between two specific members of the group, or it can be unpointed, just disrespectful behavior. If you think of the example I had started to give earlier a little bit about uh, showing up on time or being tardy to game, that could really go in a number of ways. For one, if a person is habitually late to game and it is an area that is within their control, then it could be that they are being disrespectful to the group. However, if a person has uh, explained that they have schedule constraints and they can only reasonably arrive at a certain time, yet the rest of the group is expecting them to arrive earlier because they're available, then the group can be being disrespectful to the person who is being tardy by not understanding the fact that their life constraints were already clearly communicated and they are arriving as soon as is acceptable or possible for themselves. And the final common cause of conflict would be from conflicting goals. When members of the group have different goals and they don't align with one another, it can lead to conflict, obviously. And, and this happens, in my opinion, to be 
one of the most difficult types of conflict to overcome, but we'll be getting to that a little later. One additional thing that you might find as you are attempting to identify the sources of your conflict is that it's not a single source of conflict. There can be multiple sources of a conflict. It could be any number of these five common causes, or it could even be other less common causes. But the important fact is that you identify as best you can what the source of that conflict is, because that gives you a springboard upon which to start building a method to compromise and figure out how to solve the problem that you're experiencing within your group. And now that we are aware of the common sources of conflict, let's head on over to Tricks of the Trade and figure out ideas for resolving that conflict. Resolving conflict can be a really uncomfortable thing to try and tackle. Honestly, it can be more uncomfortable than just sitting with the conflict and dealing with hurt feelings in some cases, because I think there's something about getting to the root of a problem that always worries people that a relationship is going to come to an end or things are going to be unresolvable and the situation will get worse. So innately, I think we try to avoid those sort of things, but resolving conflicts is super important for the healthiness of your group dynamic and for your own personal mental health. You don't want to be showing up to a game where you feel unwelcome or that there's power struggles that are causing you any sort of anxiety or depression or any other difficult feelings that make you not want to be part of the group or make you feel ostracized from your friend group. So one of the first things that you need to do once you have identified the source and you have decided that you want to resolve the conflict is you need to let your friend group know that you want to have a discussion about the relationship, the group dynamic, whatever it is that might be the source of the conflict. And you might receive some hesitation because nobody likes having that sort of a conversation sprung on them. So give them some advance notice. And really, one thing that our group has learned the hard way time and time again is that Digital media is not the place for this conversation. It needs to happen in person or in a Zoom call or at the very least on a, on a phone call. Make sure that you have the time to gauge people's reactions to your responses and that there's not the possibility for further misinterpretation through a digital media. So then when the group comes together to try and negotiate ways to resolve the conflict, it's very important to uh, when you're speaking, when it's your turn to state your opinions, if you've already identified what the sources of the conflict are from your point of view, share that information with the group so that they are aware that you have put thought into the conflict and you have an idea of what might be causing the conflict. Now, if, if it's an individual that's causing the conflict, don't be antagonistic. Don't use uh, statements like blaming statements. You want to use I statements when you are speaking in this uh, type of setting because it's important that you focus on how you're feeling and what you're thinking in response to the behavior that's in question, not being accusatory. That will only escalate things and make the conflict worse. So one more important piece of information that I'm going to give you on resolving conflicts, and this is very important, is that if you're in a situation where the cause is related to power struggles or conflicting goals or anything that is going to lead to people being up against one another in this negotiation for resolution, you have to be able to go into this negotiation with the potential to change your own point of view. If you are going to enter the scenario stubborn-headedly and be unwilling to adapt or negotiate or change your perspective in any fashion, then you might be as much of the problem as the other person who you feel might be having the conflict with you is. Because if you are unwilling to negotiate or bend then all you're ever going to be able to do is break and things are going to fall apart. So be willing to change your own point of view, to change your own opinion, and to listen to what the other person is saying. You might not see things the way that they see it. 
your view of the conflict and your solution for resolution might be completely different from what they see and what they're feeling and what they're experiencing. And if you will not acknowledge that, if if you won't accept the fact that there might be another solution or another way to approach the situation, then you might miss the opportunity to resolve. Don't let that happen. Now, speaking briefly to each of the common causes, let's talk about a quick resolution that might be helpful in that situation. With miscommunication, the answer is pretty simple, right? It is establishing a line of clear and effective communication. It's it's renegotiating the way that the group is going to communicate. And if the miscommunication was based on a single instance of communication, communicate that to death. Like just talk it out until there is no more miscommunication. Uh, for unmet expectations, a clear starting point to resolve that conflict is to clearly lay out the expectations of the individual, of the group, of the game, of whatever expectation is not being met. Make those expectations known and see if there is a method for which the group can can come together to meet those expectations. With power struggles, like I said, they're one of the more difficult ones to deal with. Uh, you are going to have to be able to use those I statements, come to the table, like I was mentioning, to the group with the ability to change your own perspective and be willing to accept a compromise. That is the, the main way to deal with a power struggle is the ability to effectively compromise. With lack of respect, you need to make sure that respect is restored. And if it can't be restored immediately, you need to make sure that there is a plan in place, a pathway to restore respect. Now, in the example that we used, if it was respect based on like tardiness or timeliness, the respect of the person who was tardy, if it was indeed their issue on that one, they could restore respect by learning to manage their schedule more effectively. Or if the group was the one at fault in that scenario, respect could be restored by coming to a concrete understanding of when the individual could arrive and letting the rest of the group do something else until they arrive, not jumping right into the game and being disrespectful of that person's time when they had already clearly stated when and when they couldn't be there. And for conflicting goals, again, compromise. You've got to be able to find a way to each get what you want in conflicting goals. Compromise is the key here, the same as it is with a power struggle. That's it for Tricks of the Trade. Let's head over to Knowledge Check. So let's say that you've taken all the steps. You've identified the source of the conflict. You've tried to resolve the conflict, maybe multiple times, or maybe it's cyclical. The conflict will be solved for a short amount of time, but then eventually it crops its head back up and you're having the same issues again. So for today's knowledge check, we're going to look at an article from Business Insider, uh, Nine Signs That It's Time to End a Friendship, According to Therapists. And what it says is that there's some key identifiers that a friendship has gone sour. Now, this could be a group setting, you could put it in that context, or just individually, but I do think it's some important information. And the first identifier would be the friendship is constant, constantly one-sided. It should always be a two-way street, whether it's platonic, familiar, romantic, or group friendships. But if it's always one-sided, that's a negative indicator. Uh, if your friend is betraying your trust, like if you're sharing difficult feelings and emotions with them and they are dismissive of those or they're not taking anything that you say seriously, or it jumps into the third point that is made here, which is they don't keep your secrets. If you have shared something private with them and they immediately tell the rest of the group, not a good sign. A fourth key to look for here is if the friend is overly negative and pessimistic. That is only going to cause you to come down over time and have hurt and negative feelings. A fifth sign to look for is you have little or nothing to talk about. So sometimes as you drift apart or people change, you might find that you're no longer aligned in the same interests. Even if you're in the same gaming group and you have the same idea of, of a hobby you might find that some people 
you just don't have a place to speak to anymore. And that can be nobody's fault, but sometimes it can still be a negative encounter that you want to eliminate from your life. Uh, if the person uh, creates or attracts drama is the next one. Like if one person in the group is constantly re-aggravating things and causing new conflicts to arise, that might be a sign that it's time to let them go. Um, the seventh key to look for is if the person is passive aggressive when you say no. That's a big one for me. It's important to be able to say no and to have your response acknowledged, understood, and accepted. And if that doesn't happen when you put your foot down and you say that you're not okay with something, that's a very clear sign that you may not want to be part of that friendship. The eighth is they dismiss things when you raise a concern. If you bring up a concern and they are dismissive of it, they simply let it pass by either not responding to it or they say something like, oh, well, that's not that big a deal. They don't acknowledge your feelings. That can be very painful. You want somebody who understands that your point of view, your life experience, and your personal feelings are important. And if you have a friend who won't acknowledge any of that, that's not a good sign. And the last one is they make you feel worse, not better. And I think that's just sort of a catch-all. If you find someone who is in your life and every time you're around them, they're constantly putting you in a bad mood and... There might not even be a particular reason for it. They just bring you down and make you feel miserable. It's probably a good sign that they're not meant to be part of your life. Now, all of this can be difficult in a gaming group because it means you're either having someone leave the group or you yourself might be leaving the group, which can be a really difficult thing to manage. And it can and be very hard to deal with if if that is a scenario that you're faced with. So if you do have to deal with something like this and you are struggling with it, as always, I would suggest you to reach out and find someone to talk to, whether it's a close friend or if the matter is more personal and more intense, reach out and find a therapist or a counselor or somebody who can walk you through this because these are things that they deal with all the time, how to manage friendships and relationships and talk through them and learn how to really understand your own point of view and what actions you need to take in your own life so that you can be happy and fulfilled. And that's all for today, Cyclothids. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that I have given you some points of advice that will help you the next time you have conflict within your own gaming group. As always, please leave us a rating and review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Those things go a long way in attracting new listeners and hopefully eventually finding sponsors. But until next time, we will see you next session.